Greetings, Wyoming Ag and Hort Conference participants. Um, my name is Steve Kuntz. I'm with Colorado State University. I'm going to uh, provide you with a little bit of commodity market outlook today. Uh, this particular uh, presentation is being recorded uh, Tuesday, December 29th, and provided the wheels don't come off of a uh, few things from here on out into the early the next year. Uh, I think this outlook should be good for a while. Um, and in that context, I'm going to try to talk to you what I think about are, are more uh, bigger picture, broader market impacts, things that are likely to persist throughout 2021. Some of the main things that are that are going to be happening as opposed to uh, picking a price uh, on any of these commodities at any point in time. All right, so uh, what are we going to talk about? Um, we can't help but start things out by talking about soybeans, and I know that's probably not something that interests you directly, but soybeans are back to being the market maker, market driver. Uh, soybeans, uh, prior to the trade disruptions, were really one of the major market drivers that was uh, impacting the corn market, impacting the forage market, potentially impacting uh, protein markets. Uh, the, the trade wars and those disruptions put that on hold, and it looks to me like we're back uh, talking about soybeans as, as being that market determinant. Um, so we need to talk about that a little bit. Keep your eye on soybeans. Uh, they're going to have an impact on where corn goes. I think uh, corn is looking at tighter stocks, maybe some revisions of, of last harvest production numbers, and then some surprisingly nice uh, strong exports that are driving things. Uh, sprinkle in a little bit of wheat, um, a little bit of uh, tightening in the domestic market, but bottom line is worldwide uh, wheat stocks are, are plentiful. Uh, forage, uh, we we cannot talk about these markets without talking about drought. Uh, so, so drought is going to impact what's going on in the forage side, but there are regions of the country with uh, ample, uh, reasonably poor quality uh, forage, plenty of pasture, things like that. Uh, cattle and beef, um, is there a potential for a drought liquidation? Um, yes, but not, you know, I think we'll see some of that come springtime, but not really, really uh, substantial uh, drought liquidations, not yet. And uh, sheep and lamb, I think we're dealing with uh, limited supplies, things that were happening in Australia. And going forward, it's really going to be what happens with respect to international trade and what kind of acres get planted to corn, wheat, soybeans, other crops, what, what persists in forage, for example. And uh, so with respect to trade, we're talking about economic conditions other places, and then we're talking about uh, plantings and weather um, moving forward. I think there's uh, certainly some good opportunities moving forward. And I would talk about them as opportunities as opposed to a broader, uh, broader set of optimism. Okay, let's take a look at that drought monitor. Boy, there are years I hate the drought monitor, and this is looking like one of them. Uh, so if you basically start at, um, if you start at uh, um, Laramie or, or Fort Collins and move south and west, uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse. We're in exceptional dry. Uh, conditions on the drought monitor, but there's a lot of dry weather uh, really uh, west of the Missouri or Mississippi, depending on how you look at it. The further into the southeast you go, the less uh, drought conditions you have. And uh, as of today, we've got a little bit of a, a storm moving through uh, the Front Range. Have, have given us a little bit of snow, and it looks to me like that that storm will track on across the U.S. Um, for the rest of the week, and that would be very good for uh, drought news uh, pretty much in the rest of the country. You do have to worry about what goes on in the rest of the country. That can have an impact on, on um, crop production and prices and, and general economic conditions. 
Okay, so taking a look at the, uh, this, these are moisture uh, forecasts for three month windows going through the winter on out into the spring, out into the summer. You've got a typical La Nina weather pattern. You've got, uh, if you look at the temperature map, it shows uh, warm across the southern U.S. and what comes along with the warm winter weather is usually dry weather. And then we have uh, considerable moisture across the northern plains and then through the winter and into spring months in terms of eastern corn belt. So uh, not a lot of drought relief in Colorado or uh, again, Wyoming is really on that on that bubble, um, as is Nebraska. It's going to be dry in the west, potentially for a little wetter in the east. But uh, but warm, dry, open winter moving forward is what the what the forecast looks like uh, going forward on out into the springtime. And uh, what we have had happen lately, really since July is a substantial rally in the soybean market. Soybeans moving from $9 upwards to better than $12 a bushel. Uh, the trade war was started right here this July um, 2018. We've had considerably softer soybean prices uh, with the tariff on soybeans and um, it looks to me like the Chinese are back to buying and that is in fact the case once you dig through the data. So we see soybean prices uh, returning to really uh, very good prices compared to what they were prior to the trade war. Prior to the trade war, it was high nines to, to low 11s, and we've rallied to better than uh, $12 a bushel. How much does that persist? That depends on things going forward, but it looks to me like, again, the Chinese are back to buying beans to uh, feed those hogs. Uh, to and with the pork satisfying their their demands for protein. So during the trade war, we have very weak exports for soybeans, and we're back to where they where they were really prior to the trade war. Not any sort of aggressive growth or anything like that. And what you see with the blue arrow is uh, really we had a growth in exports, and then this accelerated exports was really the the growth in uh, use by China. So we need to keep our eye on that moving forward, and that's going to be a, a major driver in the grains market, and this is going to spill over into the corn crop. Uh, those corn prices will have to follow soybeans to some degree. We have, uh, this is your weekly corn chart. Your weekly corn chart has come up off the floor of 330 into the, uh, into the mid fours. That's a pretty high price compared to how big the corn crop was. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, panic moving forward, uh, but we're also seeing some rather strong exports of corn as well. And where are they going? They're going to China. Is that some sort of uh, trade deal thing? Um, potentially, but it's also with, uh, with the mitigation of African swine fever in China. Uh, they got rid of a lot of backyard hog uh, production operations and they've gone uh, a more traditional commercial hog feeding, and that's going to require some corn. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But corn at this stage of the game is not going to let beans run to $12 and not follow along behind to some degree. These crops are a little bit substitutable in ration, not tremendously, but um, uh, energy and protein a little bit substitutable, and, and they will tend to move together. So you see your big jump in corn exports, um, and this has been really pretty much a surprise over the last couple of months with the USDA WASDE. Um, and again, where where is that big growth in exports going? It's going primarily to China. They're actually bidding corn away from other uh, traditional corn buyers. We're also seeing a little bit of a bump on the ethanol side. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much that comes back with the uh, transition of our economy out of uh, pandemic to uh, back to more normal and uh, this ethanol is uh, for consumption with gas gasoline to uh, mitigate uh, air pollution. Uh, we'll see if it grows back to traditional levels. Again, also some of this ethanol is in fact exported so we'll see how much of that recovers as well. But we've got good news on the demand side, both for soybeans and corn, and that's going to create pricing opportunities. 
So if we look at the corn uh, balance sheet, this is uh, off your WASD. And what we see is a big growth in corn exports from the prior year to the current crop year. We have uh, stocks to use about 11.5%. And the USDA is forecasting a, a farm level uh, corn price of uh, four bucks a bushel. So this is my attempt to um, make some guesses about where 2021 might play out for the rest of the year. And from here on out, it really is on the, on the demand side. There, the, we won't have much more surprises in terms of yields or, or acres like you do once you're going through harvest. Um, you know, we've got stocks to use of about 11.5%. And if we find more bushels, it'll go up a little bit. And if we find fewer bushels and have increased uh, exports, stocks to use will go down some. Um, and that, you know, the, the corn market here lately moving upwards and pressing 450 is, is, a bit, is a bit dramatic and not really supported by underlying supply and demand conditions. So I don't think we'll see continued run in higher and higher corn prices through the rest of this current crop year. But we, uh, we do need to worry about what happens next year. So we really need to see some pretty big acres. And, and what I'm doing is making some guesses at acres. <clears throat> 93 million acres in trend yields with some um, uh, consumption numbers consistent with where they are now, maybe falling off a little bit on exports. Uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. But we're looking at the corn market, uh, stocks to use increasing back up to something like 13 percent and that's a that's a high three corn market if we have any sort of hit to acres or yields and um and big increases in exports from here on out we could be up into the up into the mid fours through much of uh, 21 22 crop year and if we get tremendous acres and tremendous yields we'll be uh comfortably in the in the three dollars a bushel for uh for corn moving forward so um, my best guess for next year is really in the high threes, and that's without considering uh, too much, uh, you know, what's the risk of a drought in the Corn Belt uh, on into next year. And I think that's some of what we will see in, um, in corn prices moving forward is some, some uh, buying of corn, taking long positions just in case things are a little dry next year and, and the corn market rallies sharply. There's a lot of corn users that uh, that need that not to happen so they'll protect their positions. All right, so we have the DEES 2021, that's next harvest corn crop, uh, rallying off of 360, on up past $4 and continuing to rally sharply. And I, the, the green box is there because that's the, that's the price range I like to follow until we know something about plantings, we generally trade about 380 to 420, and we have to have a reason to trade outside of that prior to knowing something about next year's crop. We won't know about uh, corn plantings next year until we get into March. We get a, a report at the end of March, and then we get our acre numbers uh, the end of June. Okay, here's an example from back um, 2017 where that crop traded again 380 to 420. It bounced around in that range until we knew we had a really big crop in, in 2017 and then the market comes off. I think that's where we're headed with respect to the 2021 crop. We're a little bit on the top side, um, getting some of the uh, fear and panic getting priced in and I would expect us to again trade in that green region moving forward until there's a reason not to and that would that would be revealed by uh, acres numbers and uh, weather conditions once we get into the spring all right so the corn market is currently going to have to negotiate acres it's going to have to fight with beans to maintain some of those acres we need some pretty big acres next year or we will be in the fours pretty solidly uh, so the question really is through the spring, what do we get for corn and, and bean acres? And then what kinds of use play out? What's the, what's the trade demand? What's the ethanol demand? And I, I think reasonably the corn outlook moving forward is something around uh, four bucks. At harvest, we could be in the mid to high threes. 
and then later in, in the uh, crop year on into the 2022 crop year will be in the, the mid to uh, mid $4. Uh, stocks are reasonably abundant. 11.5% uh, stocks to use and 13% stocks to use is not tight stocks numbers. So there's no reason for this market to get really worried and move on up to, to five bucks. What is tight are soybean stocks. So we really need to worry about what's going on with weather in the U.S. and in the world into next year. Some worldwide uh, weather problems, in particular in South America, could create some some rather high prices that will that will benefit uh, ag producers here in the U.S. All right, let's move on to uh, wheat. You saw the drought conditions with respect to wheat, and wheat has rallied off the basement of uh, 370 upwards to uh, 580, and it's a little better than that uh, here lately. But this, again, is your weekly chart. We've rallied up to any sort of potential resistance levels. We're going to have to, we'll get a, a, a winter wheat plantings crop report in uh, the end of January, and that'll tell us what that that crop looks like. But in the end, it's, it's uh, being impacted by drought, in particular the drought conditions in Texas and in eastern Colorado are, are not boating too well for a hard red winter wheat crop. So if we look at stocks to use on the wheat side, we see that the U.S. is off um, from, uh, you know, it's off from very high levels. So we'll see better wheat prices. But if we go take a look at the worldwide stocks to consumption level, worldwide stocks to consumption in the wheat market are, are, are record high. Um, their wheat is everywhere, it's plentiful, um, you know, our weather conditions will create some stronger wheat prices, but I don't see a lot of upside potential in this market, not like uh, soybeans and not like corn. So what really matters is what we have for acres planted uh, this past fall, and then what types of yields will show up once we get into, uh, into next summer and start harvesting this wheat crop. Um, these are my best guesses for acre numbers. Some were a little better than 45 million acres uh, nationwide, upwards to 46, maybe down around 44 and a half, something close to that. And then with respect to trend yields of uh, 48 bushels an acre, that creates a stocks to use number of something close to 34%. So it's a little bit of tightening of stocks from 41% to 34%. And that will improve prices off the basement uh, four buck price that we've seen here lately. So we'll push up into the fives and we'll have better wheat prices, but the upside potential here is really limited because of, um, because of the worldwide stocks uh, conditions. Now, one of the factors with respect to those worldwide stocks is those worldwide stocks are largely in China. Uh, I do believe they will sell them if the price goes high enough, so it's not as dramatic as it might look like, but we have no reason to go to seven or eight or nine. Uh, anybody who's talking about that, I think, is uh, is getting a little bit ahead of themselves. So wheat outlook, um, strong worldwide production and use, but close to record world stocks. The U.S. is the one um, with uh, shaped production numbers. We have large hard red winter wheat stocks relative to soft. So what sort of acres do we really see? Do we see people shifting to spring wheats, things like that? The bottom line is we'll have some improved prices and hopefully uh, much stronger basis numbers for hard red winter wheat. So I'm looking for something, um, um, sorry, you've got a typo here. That needs to be 2021 for the harvest contract for 2021. We're talking about five and a half. Um, you know, and not on up into the sixes, whereas your soft contract is has better trade opportunities. So we're talking uh, something around $6 a bushel. So that's my take on the wheat side. Let's take a look at uh, forage now. You saw the weather map. Uh, you know, we're going to, we, we've entered uh, into 20. So this December 1 number for 2020 is a forecast because we don't have this report yet. It will come out at the end of uh, December. Um, we're practically in that, but uh, uh, we've got to dig through those numbers and see what goes on with respect to the, the haystocks. Uh, what kind of haystocks do we, do we really have going into the winter? And I think we have enough haystocks with respect to it being open, a relatively open winter, that once we get into the uh, 2021 
May 1, 2021, will have depleted the stocks from last year, but not tremendously, not like 18 or 19, and have incredibly high hay prices. So the hay prices are going to look good, but not um, there's some upside potential. There's some ups limits to the upside potential there. Ranger and pasture condition throughout the U.S. is in pretty poor shape. You saw the map. Really, it's only the southeast that's in pretty good shape. So this is the percent of pasture that's in poor and very poor conditions nationwide. Uh, there's a lot of it in poor and very poor conditions, almost half. And it's the southeast U.S. that has very little uh, pasture in poor and very poor condition. Not like last year. They've improved a lot over last year's dry weather. So the southeast is where uh, lots and lots of pasture is, and the southeast is where lots and lots of cattle are. So also, let's take a look at some um, potential haystocks numbers. This is from uh, back in the springtime. Again, we only get these, uh, these numbers a couple of times a year, and you really have to dig through them, sort through them, and figure them out. But what I'm interested in looking for May 1 is trying to figure out is there any region in the country that's really got abundant stocks or has depleted their stocks. So these are the absolute, uh, or excuse me, these are the percent changes. And we see that uh, the Southeast really pulled down their stocks from last year. And then we've had some growth in places, uh, places east of us and some modestly tight stocks once we go out further west. And, and going through this year's, this past year's summer will not have made this any better. So again, what I'm looking for is, is nationwide, do we have abundant or very tight stocks? And it's a little bit of a mixed picture. A little teeny bit of a growth out west, but not, not a whole heck of a lot. How about a percent change in hay acres? And again, this is uh, comparing uh, 2020 to 2019 because we don't have um, we don't have the information all the way through uh, 2020 yet, and we see some tightening of uh, what would be considered hay acres out west. A little bit of growth uh, east of us, but not growth west of us and a lot of our good hay is going that direction. So there's some there's some considerable upside potential, but there's plenty of pasture and hay down in the southeast U.S. Plenty of grinder hay that's out there. So taking a look at the Wyoming other hay price, this is pulling uh, alfalfa out of the mix because alfalfa really didn't run enough yet. You've seen some very high prices uh, going through 2020. And again, my this is a crop year, so it switches over to 2021 here in January through February, so we're not quite there yet. But we've got really good prices coming through 2020 for, uh, for grass haze and those types of things. Very strong. Not, not as good uh, or much better in Wyoming than it is in Colorado, than it is in Kansas, and than it is in Nebraska. So I think we'll see some stronger hay prices, but they'll get high enough that they weak we can that they can start shipping uh, hay considerable distances from places east of us. Okay, so um, hay prices will move higher long run. Uh, periodically, I think we'll, they will hold steady. We'll have to move higher, and then we'll ship some hay, and then they'll stay where they are. Um, my understanding is much hay moved early in the 2021 20, uh, crop year, so the hay is largely moved. I think there's plenty of people that have the hay they need to get through the winter especially with that, um, that weather outlook we had with the winter being relatively open. Uh, if you take a look at some of the more detailed hay prices, eastern Nebraska prices are considerably lower than western um, and Colorado, so I think there's some upside potential there, but there's clearly plenty of poor quality hay um, out east of us. So what really happens as we get through this winter uh, depleting forage stocks and what, and what kinds of weather do we have? The precipitation we've had here lately will we'll do a lot of good uh, work with our, our pasture and wheat crop um, you know, in the short term, but it will, uh, it will create a need to burn some hay to keep those cows warm. Uh, small bales are, are, are looking great. Um, you know, if you're if you're into that type of thing, I'd be, I, I, as I've told people over the years, you'll never get me to pick up another small bale again. I've got plenty of equipment that'll do that for me. 
Um, upside potential, you know, I think Excellent Hay has some considerable upside potential, but let's not get carried away with uh, three and four hundred dollar prices. I don't think that's going to happen. High twos, uh, mid hundreds for the good hay. There's upside potential, but it really depends on what kinds of weather we have once we get to spring. Do we have some moisture that that creates some green grass that slows down the purchasing of the hay crop? All right, let's get on into cattle. Uh, let's take a look at the third quarter of 2021. That's typically where your low prices are, and that's what we're looking for lows for fed cattle, and then on out into 2022. And, and that really doesn't look so bad. So we're talking about a buck and a half maybe for feeder cattle, and then a little better than that for, for calves uh, come next uh, wean in 2021. We're talking about um, better than a buck and a half. I think if I had to... Um, if I had to work a budget going forward uh, for my cow-calf operation, um, you know, I would use something like, to be conservative, I'd use something like $1.60 or maybe $1.65. And if I had some potential to sell some, some calves early, I'd, I'd sure be, I'd sure get carried away with doing that. And then on out into next year, 2022, we're talking a little better than that. And a lot of this is being driven by an improved economy and improved trade prospects. Uh, really, the worldwide economy is recovering much fast, much faster than the U.S. is. Uh, the U.S. is still in the teeth of this pandemic. Uh, we will talk a lot about this uh, well into uh, 2021. It will impact markets. It will impact lives. And uh, but we will come out of this. This is something that uh, for sure will happen. Okay. So on that feeder cattle contract, I like to do my technicals. You've got some, you know, what are we talking about for worst case scenarios on the downside? Um, on into next fall, maybe uh, on the feeder cattle contract, $1.30. On the low side, $1.20. What was the train wreck of the pandemic? It was $1.05. I don't think we'll have anything like that moving forward. But in terms of some worst case prices, if this is feeder cattle, what, what might you get for calves moving forward? You know, we're talking a dollar forty, a um, dollar and a quarter. Those are, if you want to pencil out some worst case scenarios, those would be some numbers um, that I might use. How about the top side? What, what, how? You know, when do I need to really act if things uh, move up sharply? If things move up to a buck and a half on the feeder side and we get up to $1.65, $1.70, $1.75 calves. If, you know, keep an eye out on those uh, video auctions on into next spring. If we get some moisture and grass starts to green up and, and people get a little carried away buying calves, I, I would for sure be pretty aggressive on, on selling if the market got that high. I would not be carried away if the market is persistently weak um, on, into, on into 2021. So I do think the fed cattle market will uh, will improve. We've got some modest decreases in production coming. We are looking at um, you know some potentially some some liquidation of the cow herd. People um, figured out they had too many cows moving forward. We're going to liquidate some of them, and that's going to um, that supply side information is going to improve prices. The bad news is there's plenty of pork out there. There's plenty of chicken out there. We've got lots of competing meats. Um, and it's, you know, we're going to have to fight those particular headwinds. We've got reasonably good domestic demand, even with the pandemic the way it is, and reasonably good international demand, but not tremendous. Um, we're going to have tighter supplies. Herd building has stopped, and uh, liquidation has started to some degree. The thing that really has me worried is if we have persistent dry weather that moves east and we create some liquidation, we could see some we could see some very low um, cow prices and calf prices as people are getting rid of cattle because they can't afford to feed them. All right, this is what we lived in 2020. We had those packing plants closed down in April and into May and run at considerably reduced capacities. Uh, that is going to create uh, no demand for fed cattle. And notice that this uh, steer slaughter was really aggressive prior to that. There were a lot of animals on feed and everybody knew it, and they were running packing plants as hard as they could go. 
Um, once we got into the pandemic and had to start closing plants for periods of time, it took us until into June to get caught back up and notice that we didn't go back up to better than the baseline. We have, we have run pretty hard, but the, the mitigation that it takes in the plants has required them to slow down a little bit. All right, that slowdown in the springtime, right when animal weights are, are starting to turn the corner and you've got just tremendously large steer weights and, and heifer weights, fed animal weights moving into the springtime. So you just have a lot of tonnage in terms of animal weights. We are working our way through this. Um, the worst appears to be behind us, but we are not completely out of the woods yet. This is your Saturday slaughter. Notice that even during that pandemic time period, we were, we were uh, attempting to run on, on Saturday as aggressive as possible. And we've been running on Saturday very aggressively all of last year and all of this year. Yeah, it's not a surprise when you have some sort of plant disruptions because of uh, operations problems if you've been running them this hard for this long. Beef cow slaughter. You saw the softening slaughter through the spring when they couldn't run the cow plants as well. We caught right up and we're not showing any sort of liquidation compared to last year or herd building compared to last year. So I think, uh, you know, it's not showing up yet in terms of the beef cow slaughter numbers. I think it will show up uh, much like last spring. We'll see some pretty aggressive culling if you've got open cows. I think they'll go to town uh, come, come springtime, come late winter or spring. All right, if you close your packing plants down and your retailers can't get beef bought, you have retail, you have box beef uh, establish record high prices. So this is something that's just going to mess our charts up going forward. These huge disruptions through April and May created tremendously high beef prices that we caught right back up with in June. So the, the this is not evidence of markets being broke. This is actually markets working. You've got tremendous profit incentives for those packing plants to, to open and run, and they were able to do that. They're also going to have tremendous pressure to do some things about mitigating uh, potential health risks. All right, this is an interesting chart. Let's take a look. I think a lot of people ate beef ribeyes for Christmas. We definitely saw that. We saw the beef ribeyes really take off following the pandemic, but when the pandemic got started, beef ribeyes actually tanked. Ribeyes, tenderloins, and loins, those things that we tend to eat away from home, uh, actually had lower prices uh, starting with some of the shutdowns. They recovered right away when supplies were, were very tight, but they went into the tank in the beginning. And this is that real disruption in your supply chain of, of um, people you know, typically eating away from home, what products they eat away from home, and if they're going to eat at home, they generally eat something different. Well, what do they eat at home? Well, they eat chucks, though. So they quit buying ribeyes, and they bought, uh, they bought uh, chuck rolls. So you have a real growth in chuck. These are things that consumers are very comfortable uh, cooking at home. You see the tremendous high prices. So what am I doing here? My point is to get, get you to think about the supply chain. We are just really used to the supply chain operating very efficiently. Um, <clears throat> again, we're, we're used to that supply chain operating very, very efficiently, and it, it did not in, in 2021, 2020. So you've got to be careful comparing back to what happened in 2020 and getting too upset about it, uh, getting upset about how much money packers made or retailers made. We really came through that pandemic time period with some with some substantial adjustments in the supply chain, we were able to pull some of those things off. And again, it looks to me like we're roughly uh, out of the woods. I was a little disappointed in how fed cattle prices didn't recover through the fall. Uh, that is in part some of those slaughter weights. We've got to move those animals, move those animals, move those animals and bring the weights down. And I would expect to see some substantially better prices uh, come springtime. But you see the real strong uh, reaction during the during the pandemic, a bit of a recovery. Uh, what did the Packers do? They 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 paid way higher prices than they 
really needed to uh, to maintain some business relationships. And then we went off into the into the summer with very heavy slaughter weights and, and kind of back to very low prices. We've seen steady gains since then, steady, steady, steady gains, and I expect to see that continue on out into, into next spring. It might be April before it happens, but I expect to see it. One of the things I, I didn't expect to see was how weak uh, cap prices were, and this is in part that really strong rally in, in uh, soybean prices and, and feed grain prices. You had people uh, that were planning on very low corn prices and then all of a sudden, whoops, what the heck is going on? So I expect to see some better calf prices, but it's going to take some, uh, some much better uh, fed cattle prices. All right, we've turned the corner with respect to uh, animal numbers, big animal numbers. Back in 18 and 19, we've, we've turned that corner. We'll get our, our cattle and calves uh, report come the end of January, and, and that will um, continue to communicate, I think, a, a tightening of uh, the beef cattle inventory, and we'll have a, a tighter supply situation. We'll create some better prices for us but we've also got some headwinds of, um, of, of higher feeding costs. So on the cattle outlook side, tighter supplies in 2021 and 22, that's going to result in better prices. We've had solid uh, domestic demand, but really no substantial growth. For me, it's been surprisingly strong through this, all this pandemic bad news. And, um, you know, but I, I don't see a lot of long-term growth potential with respect to the, to the U.S. market. The long-term growth potential will be internationally. The supply chain, the downstream is going to do well through 2021. We're, we're used to the supply chain being very functioning and stable, and it just got thrown one wrench after another through 2021, like a lot of uh, consumers did. And I think the bottom line will be better price-wise, and but be very cautious about uh, risk managing risk going forward. I think the the people went into 2020. Um, there were a lot of people that went into 2020 very optimistically about where these protein markets would go, especially with um, the protein needs in China, and they simply did not materialize because of the because of the pandemic. Uh, I think that one of the major lessons that needs to be learned from that time period is, is we need to routinely manage risk and some, some hard looks at some uh, livestock or risk protection products is, is going to be a must. So that's what I mean by, by manage risk. Take a hard look at some of those products and, and uh, don't be put off by what they cost. I think they're, they're going to be, um, you know, the, the potential for the downside is, is always going to be there, especially with some sort of market disruption. How about into uh, land prices? Uh, we're really living in the teeth of the, of the liquidation in Australia, New Zealand, those regions uh, a couple of years ago. They'll have, uh, you know, they go back into a herd, they're in a herd building phase or maybe modestly in a herd building phase with some of the continued dry weather down there. And what that does is creates opportunities for U.S. Uh, domestic producers. So we've got some pretty good market land prices uh, on into sec second quarter of next year, likewise into the second quarter of 2022, and that'll create good feeder lamb market prices um, for, uh, for lamb producers. I, I think the, you know, this, is a, this is a real bright uh, um, opportunity or op you know, this, is a, this is a situation where this market is really very strong, but it's due to the, to the, the problems that the Australians have had with respect to, uh, with respect to drought. So it's uh, a little bit of a silver lining. All right, let's move. That's it for, for lambs. I think the potential there is just really good for the next couple of years until the Australians get reestablished. Now let's take a look at uh, some input markets. I really like to, to show agricultural producers this particular chart. This shows you your oil market. Uh, in the spring of 2020, uh, oil was priced at a negative $40 a barrel. So people were willing to pay you $40 a barrel to come get the oil and take it away. Um, normally, uh, markets don't do things like that. So 
Um, again, a chart that's going to be messed up for a number of years, but we're really back rallying um, back to closer to very close to $50 oil, and that is that is good news in terms of the economy get getting going again. People traveling some, um, you know. Let's hope that. Let's hope that the pandemic is mitigated to a degree, but we're we're really seeing some. You know, this is your pandemic energy market, and the potential is, I think, to recover back to the 60s. Once we get back to $60 oil, $65 oil, then then you can draw the conclusion that the, the domestic economy is is doing pretty well. And again, let's talk about that economy. This is the change in the GDP, percent change from the prior year. Substantial slowdown in first quarter of, of 2020, a bounce back from that slowdown, but still continuing slow, a continuing slow from the prior year. And that has got not good news. Let's, let's keep our eye on that ball. There's a whole lot of people um, around the country that are in very bad shape because of that uh, economic outcome. And then um, a real big, tremendous spike in unemployment upwards to uh, better than 14%. It has recovered rather dramatically, but um, you know, 6-7% is, is still a healthy unemployment rate. And I like to show this to, uh, to rural folks in that, you know, if you work in the city, uh, your potential to be absolutely fired very quickly um, is 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 there. Any sort of economic slowdowns has these rapid increases in unemployment, and then unemployment tends to you know retreat rather slowly. This one, big spike recovery as we figured out how to how to mitigate those supply chains. Maybe things weren't as bad as we thought they were going to be. Compete people needed to continue to uh, shop for things, but they're going to in particular food, but they're going to slow down uh, consumption to some degree. So we've got to be careful and remember that that there's a whole lot of the country that's in very bad shape. And then the trade aspects, let's take a look. We had a real substantial with, uh, with the Brexit and all the gyrations that went on in Europe. Uh, the value of our currency inflated tremendously. We went from you know, an index of 100 to having currency that's 20% more expensive. Well, why is that important? Um, the first thing you have to do when you come here to buy agricultural goods is you have to buy dollars. So now your your foreign currency buys about 20% less dollars than it used to. That's substantial. You're only going to come here if you really have to. We we're seeing a little bit of a weakness in the dollar. It popped right at the beginning of the pandemic, but the dollar always pops when there's any sort of economic uncertainty. And to see this considerably weaken would be really good for agriculture, but it's, I think it's going to take time. It's not something, something that's simply going to happen overnight. All right, so the general economic outlook, huge hit to economic activity uh, in 2020. What kind of recovery, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, shape and speed of that recovery? It's not a foregone conclusion that it's, it's just going to be uh, clear sailing from here on out. Um, Huge hit to, to employment, what kind of recovery there. Uh, the manufacturing sec sector was in recession before the pandemic and, and it continues to see very little uh, investment, which is long-term spending. We are seeing corporate uh, profits at, at close to record highs. So, um, you know, the businesses, while the pandemic has gone on, the service industries have been hammered the rest of the economy tends to be working rather well. I don't know about you, but uh, where I live, uh, you know, the, there's, I, I can look outside every 15, 20 minutes and there's another UPS truck out there. So there's plenty of business being done. We're just not necessarily doing it face to face and we're not going out to that restaurant and sitting down. Okay, so um, to speak of the pandemic, you know, is this another division in the economy? We have a lot of divisions across uh, rural, urban, um, advanced education and not technical skills and not an and ability to, uh, to work online and educate online, those types of things. Is this creating another division in the economy? 
as well as opportunities. I think the opportunities are there also. We're seeing some substantial growth in government deficits and debt. We're going to talk about that. And then really, what is the world doing relative to the U.S.? When I look at what, going, what is going on economically worldwide, the world appears to be in better shape than we are. That is why you see some recent weakening of the U.S. dollar. Uh, if they're in worse shape than us, they're going to buy dollars. But they're selling the dollars back to us to, uh, to take them home, to invest them and spend them at home. So we do need to be worried about, uh, you know, I think we've got low interest rates and low inflation from here on out, but what does that really do for our currency evaluations, valuations and how does that impact exports? Uh, you know, the currency is pretty expensive now and it's going to be very good for ag if, those, uh, if, those, uh, if the U.S. dollar continues to weaken a little bit. So that, that is what I have for Outlook. I hope it persists for a while. I'm, I'm reasonably, you know, long-term optimism. You've got to be a little bit careful with that. We've got a lot of recovery left with respect to this uh, pandemic. Um, that's going to impact, you know, a variety of markets, but it primarily hits the service economy the hardest. We, we're going to talk and worry about uh, debt a lot, but I think we'll have pretty good agricultural markets uh, and commodity markets into the next couple, three years. In particular, soybeans are on a tear. They're going to drag corn with it. Uh, that dry weather in the West, you're going to have some really good uh, forage prices. And I see with, uh, with tightening cattle supplies, as long as we don't get into some really hard liquidation, we're going to see some, some better uh, calf prices moving forward, some better uh, fed cattle prices as well. Uh, not on the order that we saw in the, in the land market. The land market is really dealing with a very hard liquidation that went on in, uh, in Australia. And uh, we're not going to see something like that necessarily in the beef market. We've got to have another really dry uh, year moving, moving forward. So. Uh, keep an eye on that soybean market, keep an eye on the weather, and look for pricing opportunities across the commodities that you're involved with. Thanks very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to some of the bullpen sessions and um, uh, hearing some follow-up from, from folks. So thanks very much again.